Hey, let me say this. How many of you found that Jesus' way is better? No. No, you haven't. Because if you had, you would have shouted a whole lot louder than that. How many of you found that Jesus' way is better? Listen, reason why I love being here tonight is because it was in a room just like this when I was your age, because I'm an old man now, when I was your age, when I found Jesus' way. And I've absolutely shifted everything in my life to be about His way. And I can tell you this, not always easy, never perfect, right? But it's the best way. I can tell you that tonight we're gonna talk about your 20s, but I'm gonna boil it down to you at the very end. Really, you could sleep for the rest of it. I'm just gonna talk about Jesus. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have Jesus, nothing else that comes your way will matter, 20-something. You can add all the other stuff and until you get to a point in your life to where you understand, listen, you can have everything else, but you can't have Jesus. You won't really care or know how to have everything else, right? Until you can get to that point. So we're going to talk tonight about your decade, some things that I've learned. I'm going to try to share some wisdom with you. Um, I'm going to talk to you like a dad. Because I, I have a 22-year-old daughter, um, and I'm going to ask for some grace while, while we go about this, because here's what I believe. You're not here by accident. This is your first time here. It's not on accident. Um, there are no accidents. You're not on planet Earth by accident. You may not have found your purpose yet, but you have one. Let's pray. God, open our eyes. Help us see tonight what it is that you would have us hear. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can we thank the band? Can we thank them? A lot of you are like, who is this guy? My name is Eric. Um, I've been on staff here for a really long time. Uh, in fact, uh, our lead pastor, Sean, um, we went to the University of Kansas together. Um, I... Um, I have been here for a very long time, and um, in the last 20 years of following Jesus, I've learned a few things. And so tonight, um, some of this I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to tell you a story, and then some of this I'm going to preach to you, um, because I think it's important that we walk out of here understanding that Jesus does have a plan for us, that your 20s don't have to be wasted, that we don't have to reboot in our 30s, right? We don't. See, I'm telling you. Everything changed when I walked into a, me a meeting just like this, 21 years old. Um, I, I, I met my wife. Everything in my life changed, but it doesn't change on accident. Just because you have an encounter in Jesus, with Jesus doesn't mean that you end up following him. Lots of us have had encounters with Jesus. Very few of us turn and begin to follow him. Now, I'm not being condescending toward you. I'm just saying this is the truth. Too often we have encounters with Jesus. It's not enough to have an encounter with Jesus. You have to do something with it. you got to follow him, right? The apostle Paul, if on that road he doesn't get up and change his way, that's what repent means, is to turn the other way, then all he does is have a blinding encounter with Jesus. And then he goes back to his life. That doesn't have to be you. So I'm 21 years old. I meet Jesus in a, in a, in a meeting like this. Um, and he does. He changes my life. I know for all of us, we've had those moments. Moments where it's like, it's like an and then one day moment, right? Where something happens and everything changes. And I was thinking about, uh, thinking about the series that you're in. And what would I say to you guys that would be helpful? Um, and really, tonight, I'm not going to tell you anything that you probably haven't heard before. But I do think I'll tell you something. It's not my idea. What I'm about to tell you isn't my idea. But it's something that changed my life. So fast forward to 29 years old. Um, I'm married at this point. I'm 29. Um, I'd come on staff at a church in Rockford, Illinois. Um, and my wife and I... 
because we had just come on staff, we got invited to a board member's house. Now, at 29, yeah, I'm 46 now. There's nothing that sounds fun about going to a board member's house, right? There's nothing fun about that. I'm not, like, I'm not looking forward to it. So I tell my wife, I'm like, hey, there's a couple. They're an old couple. They were like in their 70s. They invited us to their house. I don't want to go. And Chrissy was like, well, we're, we're going to go. And I went, no, we're, we're not going to go. <laughs> Chrissy's like, Eric, we're going to go. And I'm like, Chrissy, I'm putting my foot down. We are not going to their house. We went to their house. <laughs> so we show up at their house, right? And they're 70, they're in their, their early 70s. Um, Bob was the guy's name. His wife was Val. And they were both from Germany. Thick German accent. Bob sort of waddled like a penguin, right? <laughs> so I, I, I get there and I'm thinking, all right, Chrissy, we're out in an hour. Well, I'm not staying here. I'm, th this is not what we do on a Friday night. I'm 29, right? She said, we're going to stay here, Eric, so just buckle in. So we get in, and we have dinner. And, and I'm not kidding. Guys, listen. I'm not, this, this is not preacher hyperbole. The next three hours changed my life. I was sitting across from this old German man, and I asked him one simple question just to be polite. So, Bob, tell me your story. Oh, boy. Bob started to talk, and I went from this to this to this <laughs> as he began to explain his life. Now, let me try to tell you what he told me, okay? First, his wife, they were both from Germany. He was born in 1930, okay? So he, he at 12 years old, he began to tell a story. He goes, at 12 years old, I got sent to one of the most prestigious schools in Germany. It had been around for hundreds of years. Um, he said, 12 years old, began studying soon after the Nazis took over our school because it was such a prestigious school. He said, I didn't know anything about Nazis. I was 12. I was, went to the school. 1945, if you know anything about the war, he's 15. The Allies are winning the world, World War II. And he says... Um, our professors come in, and they give all of the boys, 15 years old, 15, they give us all guns, and they say, defend your city, the allies are coming. He said, there were 15 boys in my class. They gave all 15 of us guns. He goes, half of the boys stayed, half of the boys ran. He goes, I was one of the boys that ran. I said, what happened to the boys that stayed? He goes, I'm pretty sure they're all dead. He ran at 15. For two weeks, he traveled across occupied Germany. Now, think about this, guys. He's 15, right? Most 15-year-olds can barely spell their name and remember to put on deodorant. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I can say this with confidence because I have a 16-year-old. He's 15. He's traveling across Germany. He said he was chased by Russian soldiers by German soldiers, by allied soldiers. He said, but I just kept going. I slept in cellars, in ditches, in garages, because I had to get home. He said he got home, and when he got home, um, it became pretty clear that um, as the allies took over all of Germany, that they were going to reform Germany. And he said a byproduct that was that anybody that was part of a, the SS or Nazis were blackballed. And he said, I went to an SS school. He said, I didn't know anything about being a Nazi. He goes, but it, I would never get to go back to school. He never spent another day in a class. At 15 years old, his options for life were almost zero. You want to talk about somebody who's looking at the, standing at the edge of their life and going, I, I don't have any prospects. This is Bob. Now, his wife, just a total side note, she's survived the bombing of Dresden. If you don't know what that is, Google it. It was crazy. All right? At 15, those are, those are his, that, that's what it looks like for his prospects. 
Now, I can't tell you everything. I can just tell you that by the time he was 70, he was a senior vice president of one of the, mo the largest brewing companies in the world. He was a multi-bazillionaire, right? And when he started telling his story that night, something unlocked in my brain. Chrissy's now dragging me out of the house, right? And, and I, I look back at Bob and I said, hey, would you care if I came over next Friday and talked with you? And I was like, sure. So for the next 18 months, every single Friday, I went to Bob's house. He'd waddle over to the coffee machine. The dude was a millionaire, but he always served me like cold coffee, right, from the morning. <laughs> We'd have cold coffee, and he'd warm it up in the microwave. I'm like, dude, seriously, you can afford coffee, man. <laughs> for 18 months, I went to his house. And I started learning some things as I sat with him. And so I, I brought a, a recorder, a little you know, voice recorder, and I started recording our sessions. And um, it's funny, about a decade later, I, I went back to those recordings, and I started compiling some of the life lessons that I learned was sitting with this old man who on the surface he and I had nothing in common. And yet, I realized much of what my life had become was born out of that 18 months. Not everything. It's so much. Now, I can't teach you all 30 lessons because there are 30 of them. But I can tell you about one session in particular, one that I still talk about all the time. And I talk about it in rooms like this because it was one afternoon that I showed up at his house and I was really angsty. Now, listen, I'm not saying that 20-somethings are angsty or anything, but I was I showed up and I was kind of angsty. I was sort of upset about what was going on at work. And, and I remember real, real specifically, I came in and I was like, Bob, I mean, they don't, I, I'm not passionate about the role they have me in. And I don't really like what I'm doing. And this the whole thing stinks. And they don't see my talent and what I'm really good at. They, I don't want to do all this stuff. And he was like, duh, 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 duh. sit down. <laughs> I was like, fine. I went over to the couch, sat down. He goes, let me tell you something. Now, I can't do a German accent. It sounds much more Russian. So I'm just going to do normal English. Um, he said, let me, let me tell you something. He said, let me tell you what your 20s are supposed to be about. Now, he went on in the next 15 minutes to tell me what my 30s should be about in four points, what my 40s should be about in four points, and what 50 to 70s should look like in four points. 15 minutes over coffee, not really thinking much about it. But he told me about my 20s. He said, let me tell you what your 20s should be about. Now, if you believe in taking notes, I would take notes. Because I'm going to give you five things right now that he told me that changed my life. Now, these aren't rocket science. But this is what he said to me. He said, number one, Eric, 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 you are preoccupied with youth. Our culture is preoccupied with youth. And listen, I had it much better than you because the reality is you and Instagram, it, it's all good, but it can be super toxic because you begin to believe a narrative about youth that isn't necessarily true. The idea that you're supposed to have your purpose, that you're supposed to be successful, that you're supposed to be an influencer right now. And if you don't have it now, it, you must be off somehow. Bob said, stop, 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 stop. He said, listen, your 20s are not about being successful. He goes, it doesn't really matter. He, I remember him looking at me. He goes, how old are you anyway? And before I could spit it out, he goes, I bet you're 20. And I go, well, I'm 29. He goes, how much do you really know? And I go, well, he goes, you only know what you know. I went, well, yeah. <laughs> he said, let me tell you, you don't need to be successful, Eric. That's not what this is about. What it's about, one, your 20s, number one, learning. I go, I already got a degree. He said, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 learning, Eric. See, learning isn't whether you have letters behind your name. Learning is a disposition. It's the idea that you put yourself in environments to hear, that you open your ears to listen, 
See, many of you are learning right now. Learning, he said, learning. If you took your 20s and all you did was absorb and learn, that would be step number one. He said, let me tell you the second thing your 20s should be about. And this is really important. Develop a work ethic, Eric. Now listen, I'm not dogging you guys. I'm telling you me. At 29, I like to think I had a work ethic. But the truth was, I like doing the stuff I like to do. And the stuff you want me to do, if I don't like it, I didn't like doing it. So I didn't necessarily, I wasn't all that interested in laying my hands to what you wanted me to do. I would say, well, I'm just not passionate about this. Bob said, I don't care. Do it anyway. He said, learn how to put your hand to something and finish it. Third thing he said to me, Eric, leverage your advantages. I said, Bob, what does that mean? He said, you don't need a fancy car right now. You don't need to spend so much on a wedding. You don't need a good sneaker game. You get to have a good sneaker game when you're 40, not when you're 20. He said, leverage your advantages. And then he said this fourth one. He said, be intentional. Stop waiting. I think too often we say, I want to be in ministry. I want to do this thing. And yet, I heard this said once, just because you have a thought of intention doesn't make you an intentional person. Just because you think a certain way doesn't make you that. A great example is compassion. I, I find people all the time who, if you ask them, are you a compassionate person? They would say yes, and I would say why? Well, because I have compassionate thoughts. You know what research tells you? Is that you can have a compassionate thought, and then you begin to believe you're a compassionate person, and yet you've never done a compassionate thing. See, he said, be intentional. And then he said the fifth one, and this is where we're going to live for a minute. He said, Eric, we understand your 20s should be about learning about developing a work ethic, about leveraging your advantages, being intentional. But Eric, let me make this clear. Your 20s have to be where you discover courage because you will never be what God had in mind unless you have courage. Well, my heart sank because here's the truth. Like if I'm being straight with you, I'm 29, and I didn't know if I had courage. I, I didn't know if I had what it takes. Like I looked at his life, and, and I go, yeah, you, you crawled through ditches, but I don't know if I could do that. Like I want to think that I would stand up for the right stuff, but I don't know if I have it. Like are s some people just born with courage, and I think sometimes we hear this idea of courage and we're tempted to believe that maybe some people are born more courageous than others. That's why they step out and take the risk. That's why they stand up for what is right. And then we take back seats and go, I just wasn't born with that level of courage. See, that's me too. That was me too at 29. I'm like, I, I get it, but that's not me, Bob. I don't, I don't know how to have courage. I'm not, I wasn't born with courage. I, I'm just a skinny kid from Granite City, Illinois, who got beat up a ton. Right? I don't have courage. And this is when I discovered the reality of courage. See, these other four lessons are key. But I got to tell you, gang, if you can't find the source of courage, most of life gets really, really challenging. Because most of life requires a level of courage. It takes courage to get married. It takes courage to commit your life to another person for the rest of your life, to do it in fidelity. It takes courage to raise kids in this world. I'm raising three of them. I've raised one. She's good. She's married. I'm done. <laughs> but it takes courage to live out our faith, to do what is right, to speak truth to friends when they're, not do when they're doing stupid stuff. It takes courage to stand next to somebody when they suffer from an addiction or you're watching their kid suffering from a traumatic brain injury. 
It takes courage. And the big temptation is just to believe, well, I just don't have it because I don't have it. So this is the reality. This is the conversation. This is what we talk tonight about is where does courage come from then? Like if you're not born courageous, then what do you do? I'm going to tell you a story from the Bible because that's why you came anyway, right? Hear about Jesus. Luke chapter 7. It's an awesome, awesome, awesome story. It's not a parable, something that happens to Jesus. In Luke chapter 7, verse 36, the Bible tells us this. It says that one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and he sat down and eat and ate. Now, let me tell you and give you some context as to what's happening here. Oftentimes when we read the Bible, if you don't really spend a little bit of time trying to understand context, you'll miss the whole story. And on this one, you'll miss it. See, what you need to know about this, think about it. There's a Pharisee. In other words, this is an important person. I don't think of a mayor or governor. He's an important guy. He invites Jesus, a rabbi, to his house. This is a big deal, right? Jesus was a well-known or becoming well-known rabbi at that time. So this Pharisee who's an important guy says, Jesus, I want you to come to my house, and I want you to come to my house for dinner. Now, what you need to know about dinner there, it wasn't like dinner in our house where you'd walk in, it'd be a closed room, you'd sit around a table. This Pharisee would have had an open dinner table. There would have been people from the community who would have been able to see the dinner. It would be a spectacle. And there would be poor people, those that were less advantage, disadvantage that would come and surround the outskirts of the table because that's how they would take care of the poor. The scraps from the table went to the poor. So this was a public gathering in so many ways. So Jesus is invited by this important person to come to his house. People in the community would know, oh, Jesus is going to see that Pharisee. Everybody knows who this Pharisee is. And so Jesus shows up. Now, second thing you need to know about customs, because this matters too. In Jesus' day, there were certain things you did any time an important person came to your house. It was etiquette. It was customary. And you always did this. Three things in particular. First, it was always customary, always, to greet your guest with a kiss. Now, not a kiss on the lips. Some of you guys are like, dude, I'm having a dinner tonight. <laughs> If you were an equal, you'd do like the Europeans do. You'd kiss on the cheek. If you were like a, uh, not an equal, maybe it was like a, fa a son to a father or a student to his master, you'd kiss them on the hand. But make no mistake, if you had somebody important to your house, a greeting at the door with a kiss, absolutely a must. Second thing, always, when someone would come to your house, you'd wash their feet. Now, if that was a really important guest, you'd wash their feet for them. If they were sort of not all that important, you'd at least get a servant or leave them a tub to wash their feet for you. And listen, in our day and age, we don't get all that dusty and dirty. But I was in uh, India just recently, and I was reminded that it's still in many places of the world. Like you walk around, you get dirty and dusty really, really quick, and having something to sort of wash you off it's kind of nice. So always a kiss at the door. Always a tub to wash your feet. And then secondly, and thirdly, if you were a really, really good guest or host, you would have oil, refreshing oil. Because think about it. There was no deodorant. People smelled pretty bad. So when you came to dinner, to be able to refresh yourself, um, with some water and then to have some anointing oil. This, this was really, really customary. Now remember, remember what I told you. This was a guest. Jesus was an important guest, an important person's home, and everybody would have seen this. Jesus shows up. This Pharisee, the Bible tells us, does none of these things. None. Doesn't that make you wonder, why would somebody do that? Like, why would someone invite an important guest to their house 
and then do none of those things. Like, that seems like a slap in the face. That seems like somebody's trying to make a point. You think? You don't invite somebody important to your house and then don't show up and kiss them or wash their feet or give them oil. You don't do it when everybody's watching unless you're trying to make a point, right? You've seen Mean Girls, right? <laughs> this is a Mean Girls moment. This is this Pharisee going, he's a nobody. He sure isn't important to me, and I want everybody to know. This was an embarrassment to Jesus. It was to make him look stupid. He was threatened by Jesus. The Bible tells us he gets nothing. And here's the part that's shocking to me. Is that everybody would have seen this. They would have seen Jesus standing there looking like a fool. Being made look stupid by an important person. And his disciples, we assume, are, are there. They don't do a thing. They don't do anything. Now, I want to say something about the disciples. Because I think sometimes you think of a disciple and you think they look like me. Like 46-year-old, distinguished beard, <laughs> bald head. No, 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 guys. Disciples were younger than you were. The guys following Jesus were probably between 16 and 19. They're just a bunch of kids. That's what the disciples were. So like when you see the disciples do stupid stuff, the reason why they're doing stupid stuff is because they're a bunch of high school kids. <laughs> high school kids do stupid stuff, right? The disciples are, they don't do anything because they're like, I don't, what, what, I, I, don't, I don't know, all right? <laughs> Jesus is standing there looking stupid. The disciples do nothing. And then something miraculous happens. There's one lady. The Bible tells us that she's a prostitute. Now, this is important. We know this for sure. She wasn't an invited guest, okay? She was one of the people standing in the outer court. She would be the one that is disadvantaged and came for some extra food. Or maybe, maybe, maybe she heard about this man who talked to sinners, who treated them like people. And she just wanted to see. I don't know why she was there, but she was there. And she, like everybody else, sees Jesus being treated like a fool. And I don't know if you've ever had a moment of holy indignation. You ever had one of those moments? Like where you can't keep your mouth shut? Where you can't not say something? I had one of these moments recently. And look, I'm a pretty chill guy most of the time. Like I don't get all that fired up about most stuff. Um, I'm pretty happy-go-lucky. And when I go on trips and fly, and I travel a bunch on behalf of the church, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but when I get on planes and stuff, I just want to keep to myself. I put up every flag known to man that's like, don't talk to me. Like headphones and books and iPads. It's like, dude, you know, don't talk to me. I, I mind my own business. I just, I'm not really feeling like conversation. Well, I'm walking in line and there's a fella in front of me. And the lady, I don't know, she must have been having a bad day for United. And um, she was checking in. And you know how they call the numbers? Number one, number two, number three, number four. Well, they call number one. So I'm getting up there, and the guy gives her a ticket, and he wasn't number one. He's like number three. And he, we were on number one. Well, the lady sees the ticket, and she goes, sir, I called number one. Well, it was obvious that he was hearing impaired. He, he had two hearing aids. Well, he couldn't hear her. She said, sir, I called number one. Then she begins to berate him. Well, he can't turn his hearing, his hearing aid up. He doesn't know what she's saying. She is so awful to him in the next, like, 30 seconds that she's like, sir, just move aside. Just move aside. She took my ticket, and I'm walking down the runway, and holy indignation began to rise up in me. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. Don't rise up. Please don't rise up. I just want to go on the plane and watch my show. 
and I couldn't not say something. I was like, and I went back. I'm like, you can't say that to him. It's wrong. She's like, excuse me? Who are you? Uh, you ever had one of those moments where you just can't sit still? You're like, I, I can't not say something. I have to say something. This is wrong. This prostitute has that moment. She sees what's happening to Jesus, and she's like, I should stay. I should shut up. I should shut up. They're going to kill me. I shouldn't go. She does it anyway. She's like, no, I'm not, I'm not going. Now, listen, listen. What happens next is absolutely intentional. And see, that's the beauty of this story. If you don't know the context, you miss the beauty of everything that's about to happen. A prostitute. Nobody wants her there. Listen, this could cost her her life. What she's about to do is crazy. She separates herself from the crowd. There would have been a gasp. And she walks over to Jesus what was the first thing that every honored guest gets when you walk into a house? A kiss, right? But she's like, I'm no equal. I'm not even like worthy to kiss his hand. She dropped to his feet and she kissed his feet. And everybody would have seen it. What's the second thing that everybody gets in a house when you're honored guest? You get a bowl of water. She didn't have water. She just started to weep on his feet. Like she started to cry on his feet. And she didn't have a towel. She had her hair. She cleaned his feet with her hair. And then this is amazing. The most precious thing that woman had in life was a chain like this that on it hung alabaster oil. That oil was the only thing that made her work and her life even remotely bearable. The smell was pungent and strong, and beautiful, and it was expensive. And yet Jesus didn't get oil when he came in. So she takes her most precious thing in life because Jesus deserved it, and she poured it on his feet, and everybody would have seen it. See, I, I see this story, and I thought, a woman like this, doing something like that, that takes courage, doesn't it? Courage to step out of the shadows. Courage to do the right thing. Courage to pour her oil on her feet. And I thought, where does that come from? Because that's what I want. Listen to what Jesus says. Listen to what he says. Luke chapter 7 Verse 47, so I tell you, now listen, all her sins are forgiven. He looks down and he goes, this, this lady, this person that you look at and you think is absolutely lost, all of her sins are forgiven. Now listen, and that is why she's shown great love. That's where her courage comes from. See, the reason why I ask you up top about his way is because when you really discover his way and you discover how far off it is from your way and that he bridged the gap between your way and his, that his grace spans that, something happens in us. Something happens when we begin to understand that there is a God who sent a son to bridge the gap between us. We talk about it in terms of grace, but when you get it, when you truly get it, something rearranges in your heart. See, this happens to this lady. She experiences God's love, and I love, John Ortberg says it this way. He's an author that I absolutely love. He said, when that woman hears Jesus teach, the thought occurs to her that she, right there in her life, right there in her sin, that she is loved by God. And he thinks of her and longs for her as if she were his daughter, that she's valued and that it's not even too late for a woman like her. That's grace, see? 
where does the courage that Bob talked about in that room come from to live the life that Jesus had in mind when he thought you up? Right? You realize he thought you up, right? No, no, you didn't accidentally happen. I don't care what your parents told you. No, no, no. He thought you up. He thought you up. You need to ruminate on that. Some of you have been living in a space for way too long because of something your dad or your mom told you about you or something someone made you believe about you. It ain't true. He thought you up. He doesn't have accidental thoughts. is isn't like he was one day, one, oh my gosh, how did Eric get there? <laughs> what are we going to do with him? <laughs> right? He thought you up. Grace. That's what it takes. When we begin to understand what grace really is in our lives. I heard, um, it was years ago, it was one of the most profound sort of moments. I got a chance to spend some time with a theologian named Dallas Willard. He's one of my heroes. He's passed, but he's brilliant. Dallas said this one time. He said, Eric, let me tell you about grace. We often think grace is for the saving of our sins, that sinners use grace. He goes, Eric, saints burn grace like rockets burn rocket fuel. See, grace is where courage comes from. When we begin to live in his grace, experience his grace, understand we can't live outside his grace, all of a sudden something shifts in us. Listen, you are talking to the scaredy cat of the world. I am at 29, fearful of most things, fearful that my life wasn't gonna amount to anything, worried that I'd never find my passion, didn't know if I could step out, but Jesus did something, and in that moment it was reinforced. Do you know to this day, not because I'm anything special, I am about as ordinary as it gets, but I've never been fearful to walk through the largest slum in East Africa and tell people about Jesus or the slums in Haiti or go to Afghanistan this spring because now that I understand God's grace and I know what happens in the end, I'm like, well, what are you going to do to me? You going to kill me? Awesome. <laughs> I remember this. Um... I'm going to wrap up. I remember this. Band, you can come up. I remember when I was in my 20s, I took a job at a YMCA. And, and, and at that YMCA, I met this four-year-old kid who I remember, uh, the, the Y that I worked at, most of what I did in the afternoons were work with kids with disabilities. And there was one kid in particular who was four, who um, at four, this is heartbreaking, he had been through so much trauma sexual abuse, that he sat in a corner and rocked all day long. He wouldn't interact with the other children. He would throw violent temper tantrums. He was absolutely unhinged because of the damage. He was the most broken little human being that I'd ever seen. And I remember thinking when I saw this boy, it was soon after I came to Jesus, I began thinking, I wonder if there would be anybody who would ever offer that boy love or advice, I wonder if he'll ever find a life worth living. I still to this day wonder like, how does that boy stay out of jail or an early grave or stay off the streets? I remember when I was in that job, scrolling through my head and thinking, what are the options and what government program could help him and what schooling can help him? Maybe some school he can get into will help him. Maybe he'll find his way into counseling. But you know what I've become to realize about the reality of the human heart, that there isn't a government program or a school or a counselor. And while I'm all about counseling, those things can't change a human heart. The only thing that changes a human heart it's the power and the love of Jesus Christ. It's the love that conquers sin, that wipes out shame, that heals wounds and reconciles enemies. 
and patches up broken dreams and ultimately has the power to change the world one life at a time. See, you find your courage when you find that love. When you tap into that and it begins to change your heart, to change you into something you could never change yourself into. That's where courage comes from. Listen, let me talk to you for a minute if you can hear me. Let me say this to you. All of you have been gifted with this life that you have right now. And let me be really clear to every single one of you in every single seat. To live the life that God had in mind for you. You're going to have to yield yourself fully to God, and that's going to take courage. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's your job to cast a powerful and biblical, God-honoring vision of what life with him can look like to the world around us. And guess what? That takes courage. And, And you're going to have to build a family later in life that loves Jesus, and that takes courage. We're going to have to insist with pit bull determination as a group of followers of Jesus that his gospel be preached outside these walls, that believers are equipped, that the poor are served, and that the lonely be brought into community. And all this takes courage. Listen to me. It takes courage to find your calling. It takes courage to fulfill your calling. It takes courage to survive your calling, to raise strong families, to bring honor, Jesus' name, to strive to say yes. Listen, it all takes courage. It takes courage. This is what Bob meant. Eric, to do the life that Jesus had in mind, it takes courage. And the only place you can find a well of courage is in the grace of Jesus. In the grace of Jesus. Psalm 27 one says this, and I love it. It's the message paraphrased, but it's beautiful. With God on my side, I'm fearless, afraid of no one and nothing. See, that's courage, and it only comes from him. And listen, maybe some of you haven't experienced that grace quite yet. Maybe you haven't really experienced who Jesus is. So let me be clear as I close. Romans 10, 13 promises that whoever calls on Jesus' name, that they'll be saved. It means that if you call, if you ask, you'll be saved. You could be a college kid from Kansas. You could have made a myriad of mistakes. You could have screwed up everything to this point. But if you call on his name, you will be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans, we then have to repent It's just a fancy way of saying, hey, just don't do what you've been doing. Find him and then go his way. Repent. He said, listen, this is what it takes to be saved and live in the fullness of life in Jesus. And if you don't know him, you can know him. Look, you can make a lot of mistakes. I have. I certainly haven't lived a perfect life, but if I could encourage you to do one thing, is to really find Jesus. Now, like tonight, if you haven't found him, you should. And if you haven't been following him, I suggest you start. It's a really great way to go. It's the best way. Will you stand with me? With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask it simply. If you'd like to make Jesus Lord of your life, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else weird. I'm not going to ask you to come down front. But I am going to ask you to acknowledge the fact that you are a sinner who are in need of saving by grace. That you want to give your life over to the destiny maker. 
that's you, feel like I'd like to give my life to him, I'm going to count to three. One, don't be afraid to raise your hand. This is your moment. We've all had them. Two, Jesus brought you here on purpose. Three, if that's you, raise your hand. Oh, awesome. Heaven just got a little more crowded. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to do the same thing. Some of you have made a commitment. You just haven't been following him. I came here to tell you that the courage you need to live the life that Jesus had in mind can only be found in the fullness of his grace. You have to follow him, though. So I'm going to count to three, and if you have not been following him, if you have not handed your life fully over to him, maybe you made a decision a year ago, five years ago, when you were 15, I don't know. But you have to start following him. So on the count of three, if you're like, man, that's it. I'm drawing a line in the sand. This is my day. This is my night. I'm going to give him fully my life. I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three, raise your hand. All over the place. All over the place. Jesus, will you burn this moment into our hearts? There are literally dozens of people who are putting their life into your hand. Help us remember this moment when we're tired, ready to give up, when we question our destiny and our purpose, God, may we remember that everything we need can be found in the fullness of your grace. Help us live in it. Help us to be comfortable in it. God, we know that we can find our courage to live in it. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for what you did on the cross. It was because of that we can truly live now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's worship together.